Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and the <coughs> Sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.
who for the glory of your name and the salvation of souls bestowed on the priest St. Lawrence of Brindisi a spirit of counsel and fortitude. Grant, we pray, that in the same spirit we may know what must be done and through his intercession bring it to completion. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. The love of Christ impels us to have reached the conviction that since one died for all, all died. He died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who for their sakes died and was raised up. Because of this, we no longer look on anyone in terms of mere human judgment. If at one time we so regarded Christ, we no longer know, know him by this standard. This means that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old order has passed away. Now all is new. All this has been done by God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. I mean that God, in Christ, was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's transgressions against them, and that he has entrusted the message of reconciliation to us. This makes us ambassadors for Christ, God, as it were, appealing through us. We implore you, in Christ's name, be reconciled to God. For our sakes, God made him who did not know sin, to be sin, so that in him we might become the very holiness of God. Verbum Domini
may God bless us, and may all the ends of the earth hear him. Sancti Evangelii secundum Lucam. Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority to overcome all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them forth to proclaim the reign of God and heal the afflicted. Jesus advised them, take nothing for the journey, neither walking staff, nor traveling bag, no bread, no money. No one is to have two coats. Stay at whatever house you enter and proceed from there. When people will not receive you, leave that town and shake its dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, spreading the good news everywhere and curing diseases. Febum Domini. I learned a couple of weeks ago about uh, a country I'd never heard of before. It's uh, east of Africa, north of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. It's made up of 115 islands. It's called Seychelles. Seychelles, and the capital is Victoria. And I learned about that just uh, on July 13th, actually because we received an email at EWTN from a woman in Seychelles. And she wrote this, Dear EWTN brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm Janet. I'm a Catholic. I live on Mahi Island in the Seychelles archipelago. I am a new viewer of EWTN TV. In fact, I love it so much. I want to thank you for the great work you are doing to evangelize the world. I'm happy to watch the Daily Mass and the other programs. Hello, Janet. Especially the journey home in my home all the way from far off USA. I feel deeply connected to all other Catholics around the globe. That's what we hope EWTN accomplishes, that we're united in our one faith, one Lord, one baptism. I deep, feel deeply connected to all other Catholics around the globe. I wish to encourage other Seychellos Catholics to watch EWTN as it is so enriching to our faith. My nation is 80% Catholic. I praise, glorify, and thank God for all the hard work you are doing. May God bless you and your families. The work of evangelization. You know, the Lord, in today's gospel, he sends out the apostles. He associated others with his work. And 
all the members of the church, as Pope Francis says, are not just to be passive in the work of evangelization. We all have a role to play in spreading the gospel, the life-giving gospel that brings life to people's uh, hearts and minds, that enriches our personal lives, our families, and society and the world as a whole. There's a recent book that just came out this past year called Catholic Street Evangelization, Stories of Conversion and Witness. And it's about the group, it's a relatively new group, and I was excited because I wanted to have them on the Church Universal series that I have for some time because it's, a, it's really a youth movement. A lot of young people are involved in this movement of St. Paul Street Evangelization. And there's 160 uh, groups in four countries around the world, predominantly in the United States. In fact, there are two right here in Alabama. There's one in Gardendale, there's one in Tuscaloosa, where the University of Alabama is. And so it's called St. Paul Street Evangelization. And so Steve Dawson edited together a book of different stories of those people that have been involved in street evangelization. So this book was put together Catholic Street Evangelization, Stories of Conversion and Witness. And he realistically says, as you can imagine, they set up a place in a busy street where they have a picture of the Sacred Heart, the Immaculate Heart, and they'll simply offer people a rosary and talk to them about the Catholic faith or if they have questions about the Catholic faith. He says, you know, there have been times that we've done street evangelization, the entire day seems dry. There's no particularly good conversations. We run into people who want to argue or don't take our presence very well. It doesn't often happen, he says. In fact, that was something that surprised them. That they thought there would be more opposition, there'd be more uh, indifference, but they found that people really responded. So many people responded that it encouraged them to continue the work. So he says there are those dry days. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. But it's an opportunity for us to be faithful without any signs of success. Quoted Mother Teresa who said, God does not ask us, ask us to be successful, but to be faithful. But he says, it seems like the teens who are involved in this work, they never have dry days. Because somehow sincere young people, evangelizing really touches people. That their hurts, their questions, their hunger for the truth, that the teens were thanked over and over again for their presence. Think about that, you teenagers here and with us through television, radio, and internet. He ta talked about one project in Chapter 7 of the book, the, the Flint Mission Project. Flint, Michigan, for three years, uh, was said to be the most dangerous city in the United States. And so they set up a, a, on the corner of West 1st Street and Saginaw in downtown Flint, Michigan. And so one of the first people that came up was an older lady. And so one of the young teenagers, Paul, he said, would you like a free rosary? And he had a bunch of them draped over his arm. She said, well, what was that? He said, would you like a rosary? They're free. And she looked up at him and said, why, sure, thank you, young man. Do you know how to pray the rosary? No. So he gave her a little pamphlet and described how to pray the rosary. You think about, he said, the different events in the life of Jesus and Mary, his mother. Well, now, thank you, young man. I know I would have to study to get it right. Is there anything you would like us to pray for? My friends and I are here to pray for whatever people ask us to. And with that, she began to weep. She took out a tissue and she began to cry because she was just leaving the courtroom where her landlady wanted her evicted from the apartment. Simply, she said in her words that 
she doesn't like me, she doesn't want me, I'm going to be out on the street, I'm sick, and I don't know what I'm going to do. So another one of the teenagers, Kelly, came up and she said, I'm so sorry to hear that. Can we pray for you right now? And they prayed together for this woman. And you could see this peace come over this lady as they're praying to Jesus and trusting her to Jesus' providential care. And at the end of the prayer, she was visibly calmer. She looked up, smiled at Paul and Kelly and said, you know, you young people are really what I need this morning. That prayer is what I needed to hear. I know my sweet Jesus will take care of me. So this one encounter of bringing the gospel out there, and to bring healing, that's what the Lord sent the apostles out to do, to proclaim the gospel, spread the good news everywhere, and to cure diseases. Sometimes the most difficult diseases are those of the heart, the pains, the hurts. And Steve goes on to say that, you know, that this was really something that the young people experienced. It was like a different world to them. And it was something that affected them personally of their own personal lives. As Kelly said, you know, I realized that I'm not the only one with a few little problems because they're encountering all this brokenness of people there in the streets of Flint, Michigan. But then there was another encounter that they had where they see this man, he's covered with tattoos, he's got two large gauge earrings in his ears and he's bald, and he's walking toward their table and they're thinking to themselves, now if anybody's gonna punch us, it's this guy. So they're wondering what's gonna happen and two of the teens, the two young ladies go up to him and said, um, do you like a rosary? He was kind of caught off guard. He said, hey, are you guys Catholic? Yep, we sure are. What about you, sir? Do you profess any religion? Well, I've been a Buddhist my whole life, but I just finished reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We talked to him for over an hour. What are the chances of meeting someone who's interested in the Catholic faith, who has questions, just finished reading the entire catechism of the Catholic Church? Finally, someone asked him point blank what was keeping him from becoming Catholic, and replied that nothing was, now that his questions had been answered. But a year later, they lost touch with the man. A year later, they saw him. He was still interested, but he said that he hadn't yet uh, embrace the Catholic faith, holy or receive the sacraments. Steve said, some people might call that a failure, but I know that success is not measured by the people we meet who end up becoming Catholic. A better measure of success is our openness to what God is asking us to do and being faithful to that, being detached ultimately to the outcome of leaving the success to God. Ultimately, he said, it's God's work, not ours. And I like this quote he has of Pope Francis, who says, the mission is not like a business transaction or investment, <laughs> or even a humanitarian activity. It's not a show where we count how many people come as a result of our publicity. It's something much deeper, which escapes all measurement. The Holy Spirit works as he wills, when he wills, and where he wills. And we entrust ourselves <coughs> to him without pretending to see striking results. So God wants to use all of us. Often it's within our own sphere of influence, with our own family members, with our peers, with those we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives that we can bring the gospel to bear in their lives. Why? Because the gospel is something that enriches everybody's life. And we look at the world and all the troubles of the world, what's the answer? The gospel is the answer, as it's always been the answer. That's what brings life and hope and meaning to people's lives and order to their lives. And not only for this life, but for the life to come, eternal life. It's proclaiming that hope that we have in the Lord forever. Now today, we're celebrating a feast that probably many 
have not heard of. It's a Franciscan feast. And you know, in the Franciscan calendar, there are actually three Franciscan doctors of the church. There are over 35, I think, now doctors of the church. St. Therese being one of the most recent. There's others that also have been made more recently doctors of the church. So it's saying that their teaching has a value for all generations, really, is what it's saying. People like St. Teresa of Avila, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Anthony of Padua, who is a Franciscan, we call him the evangelical doctor because he knew the scriptures so thoroughly. St. Bonaventure we call the seraphic doctor because of his lofty teaching, and he also wrote a beautiful biography of our seraphic father, St. Francis. But St. Lawrence of Brindisi, and he's in the heel of the Italian peninsula. So Brindisi is in that heel part, the lower part, on the Adriatic side. That's the area where he was from. And they have a tradition in Italy, as they did at the time. He lived in the 16th century. He died on his 60th birthday, which was in the year 1619, July 22nd. But they had a tradition then where on Christmas, a 12-year-old would give the homily, would give a, you know, exhortation on the incarnation. And so he was chosen. And throughout his life, really, he was known as being a person who was able to give these moving talks that would often bring people to tears. So he was, he was our apostolic doctor. He was a Capuchin friar. And he went throughout the whole of Italy by the time he was 40 years old, other places, he knew multiple languages. And he would preach and people would be in tears. Here's what a contemporary of St. Lawrence of Brindisi said of him. He seemed wholly melted with the love of God and his zeal and earnestness and denouncing sin touched the inmost hearts of his hearers and drew from their eyes an abundance of tears. So bright was his countenance that one could not bear to look at it, and his eyes sent forth a flame of both severity and sweetness that at once terrified and attracted. Copious tears and perspiration ran down his cheeks while he preached, and the people were so moved by his words that they implored aloud forgiveness of their sins. St. Paul, the great apostle, said this in our first reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 today. He said, the love of Christ impels us. That's really the only thing that will motivate anyone on the long run, is love. And Paul says, as St. Lawrence would say, as those involved in the Catholic street evangelization would say, it's the love of Christ that impels us. That's what gives us meaning and drive. Because he died for us. And that we are now ambassadors for Christ. Appealing, God appealing through us. Be reconciled to God. That's the appeal to all who are reached in Seychelles or wherever you are in the world. God's appealing through us, through this network. Be reconciled to God. Find life in Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. 